Okay, um, so we left off last class uh, talking about the dot product of two vectors, but of course in physics that relates as the work uh, done by a certain force pushing something, a certain distance, force dot distance. Um, this should, I guess should be kind of obvious, and I think you had to use this in your homework anyway, but the overall work uh, would be due to, of course, the net force. So if you have multiple forces, you know, each force can be considered to be doing some work, and you can add up all those little works and get the net work. So you could either figure out what the net force is or separately, you know, do each force dot the distance and add it up that way, either way. Mainly just pay attention to what the question is asking for. Is it asking for net work or is it asking for the work done by one specific force? But work done by gravity, just realize, of course, the force of gravity is pulling objects down. So if that force is down, you know, you just have to consider, well, is your object going up or down? If your object is going up, what is the sign going to be for the work due to the force of gravity, positive or negative? Negative. When they don't match, you're going to end up with a negative work. Uh, what would that make the angle between these two vectors? And this, this W is weight, but the angle between these two vectors is 180. And the cosine of 180 was, yeah, negative 1 if you picture that graph. So that was why, of course, we ended up with our negative sign. In the picture on the other side, what's the angle between the two vectors if the box is falling? Zero. They're at the same angle, same direction. So the angle between them is zero. Cosine of zero was one. That was how we got our maximum positive value when the force and the distance match. Make sense? OK. If you have some applied force, like somebody's lifting an object, and so you're going to have work due to gravity and work due to this applied force. They would have to be equal if, well, if the applied force is the only other force. Um, and if something is stationary before and after the time frame you're considering. Because if something's stationary, changing kinetic energy is actually zero. So from that, you know, kinetic energy work theorem, the work due to gravity would equally applied work, except they would be opposite in signs, because your net has to be zero. So that leads us to this problem. Okay, which you had a problem like this anyway. Um, but it says a man wishes to load a refrigerator onto a truck using a ramp. We've got a 100 kilogram refrigerator. It's initially stationary, and it's pushed up a ramp of length four meters to a height of one meter where it stops. So it's initially stationary, and then it stops. So right away, I know what the net work is. What should it be? Net. The, what is the work done on this refrigerator? OK, what forces are acting on the refrigerator? The OK, there is a push force, an applied force. What else? Gravity, and it did say it did say it was frictionless, I think, or ignore friction. Of course, that's going to be difficult for him to walk at all. But assuming he somehow is able to pull that off, um, you only have two forces really acting. Well, I shouldn't say that. You have three forces acting on the refrigerator. What's the third force? The normal force. Does the normal force do any work? No, why in this case? Yeah, because the, the normal force would be perpendicular to the ramp has, yeah, which would be 90 degrees from its direction of motion. So that if you did the dot product there, you'd just get zero, because cosine of 90 would be zero. Anyway, so you've got three forces. Normal force really doesn't help as far as doing any work. But as far as thinking about the, rather than thinking about the forces, what was the other formula we just went over for that homework problem? that you can use to get work as well. 
Yeah, our change in kinetic energy formula, 1 half MVF squared minus 1 half MVI squared. All right, so change in kinetic energy is also equal to the work. Well, what is the initial and final kinetic energy? Yeah, it's originally still and it eventually stops. So our net work is zero. Does that mean the forces don't do any work at all? No, they just have to be equal and opposite. They have to cancel out. All the forces should add up to zero. Anyway, how much work is done uh, on the crate by its weight? All right. Well, you can do this two ways. And I think the easier way is to like, sort of leave weight alone, but change the direction of the distance. Not change the direction, but dot product. OK. So the force, I need to know the force done by weight. How do you calculate something? Mass times gravity, which I think it was said it was 100. OK. So we've got 98.1 times the distance traveled. But which distance do you use? Isn't it Oh. Well, excuse me. Which distance do we use, though? You've got two distances listed. The, yeah, the distance that matches the direction of your force. So you know weight's down. So I need to know the vertical distance traveled. I don't actually care that it went four meters along this ramp. I just care about the up and down. And you would have to do that. The, no, the other way of doing it was we could use the four meters traveled, but we wouldn't exactly use weight. We would have to use, yeah, we'd have to use weight parallel. But I'm not given an angle, so I really can't calculate weight parallel. So I just have to use the vertical distance to match this vertical force of gravity. So 981 times 1. Hopefully I can pull that one off. And it is a scalar, so we don't need a it's not negative direction. It's down the yeah, but I do need to look at my signs. Is it positive one, negative one? Like, do I need to stick a negative sign on there or not? Erica says yes. Yeah. Yes. Because we went, we went up, but the force is down. So we do need to stick our negative sign on there or just make that negative one. And now what was our unit for work? Joules, so stick a J on there. And that should sort of make sense because the force of gravity isn't helping. It's not like helping move that way, then it's going to be negative work done. All right, but we know that the work done was zero. So where's the other work coming from? Man. The man. So how much work is done by the on the crate by the man, well, it's got to be the same thing. We know work net equals zero because change in kinetic energy equals zero. Equals, I don't know, work weight plus work guy. So of course, you know, it's the same value, but opposite sign. Now let me ask you this. Now that we know the work that the guy does, because it just simply has to balance out, mm -hmm. could we just divide by 4, which was the length of the ramp this way, and figure out what his force was? Okay, so we know we know the guy's work is 981. Mm -hmm. We know this distance traveled was like four meters. Could I just divide by this four meters and say that that was the force of the guy? Well, he's sort of pushing that way. He's pushing up, yeah. So his push force would be this way. Based on how I've asked this question, you're thinking no. Now. Sort of, maybe, no. I'm going to say the answer is no. Why? 
because you're asking about the horizontal distance when you need to find the results and to do that? Oh, that's what Emily's saying. No, it, the directions do need to match, but I wouldn't argue they are matching. He is pushing the refrigerator this way, and it travels you know, this distance, four meters, the same way. It's, it's not a direction issue. I thought it said Okay. Because I, right, I picked the right distance. I picked four instead of one. My question is, can we divide by the distance to find the force? the guy applies. There's something misleading about my question. Uh, sort of. Not that the force was zero, but is there a one force exerted by this guy? Is there one set force exerted by him? No. There would have to be a net force to get it going, right? Because if it's stationary, the net force is zero. But if I want to get it going, I'm going to need to pro provide some extra force, a net force, to accelerate it. Would we assume that this just keeps going faster and faster and faster the entire time? I mean, it eventually stops, right? So the misleading part of that question is there isn't just one force exerted by the guy. So this would be a variable force example. He's obviously pushing pretty hard to get it going, but in the end when he wants to slow it down and stop it, his force is less and less and less. So that is our next section. How do we analyze work when the force is a changing thing? And you know, in real life, forces are often variable. It's not like we usually have set forces we can analyze. Um, but that's leading into our next topic. So then when you divide that for you, are you finding the average force maybe? And that force that you yes. And, yes. And we often see that equation as an average example, like the work is this average force times this distance. If they say average, sure. Um, but if it's variable, we may have to do other things. Which, like what other things, you know, in math, do variable forces lead into, do you think? Changing things over time. Yes, our calculus. We gotta go over a little bit of calculus stuff today. Uh, Follow-up question here. It says, the man claims he will do less work to raise the refrigerator if the ramp length L were increased. Meaning, he's still going to get the refrigerator up to this height, but he's got a like longer ramp. So his distance would definitely be longer. Does he do less work in that case? No. No. He can't do less work because he's still got to balance out the work done by gravity. What does he do less of? The force. Do you remember what topic that related to from physical science? Changing the distance, changing the force. What is this thing called in physical science? Oh, simple machines with the inclined plane. Yeah, simple machines with the inclined plane. And it's supposed to help us just Yeah, it's this guy's. Uh, force could be minimized by a longer inclined plane. Now, that's not to say he does any less work. As far as the definition of work is concerned, the force dot distance would end up being the same. But what he does do is less force, and that is you know, easier on us. We need less muscles to do less force. Is the same amount of work if he, just, if he was right in front of the truck and he just lifted the refrigerator? Exactly. So I would say it would be the same amount of work to just like climb a fire pole up to the second floor rather than walking up the stairs. Same amount of work, you're lifting your body, but definitely a different distance. And of course, you'd be using your arms instead of your legs. But um, OK, so is this statement valid? No, it is not valid. What will be decreased is force. Same with like the pulleys and other simple machines. OK, so work done by a variable force. Recall the integration represents the what under the curve of a graph? Area. Uh, I picked a velocity example as hopefully will you remember that one. What was the area under a velocity graph or the integral of velocity? Good. That would be position. Um, so if it was a nice graph like this where it made like a rectangle, we knew some area formulas we could use. But if we had a curve, we were always kind of stuck with calculus. So here is our variable force formula for work.
still essentially the same thing, force times a distance. Except remember our little calculus definition of integration. You know, you're multiplying the force by like an infinitely small section of displacement. And then adding all that up. And make sure you have your little limits on there. From whatever your starting position is to your final position, that's how you get the distance in between displacement. Okay, so of course this could apply in any any and all directions, you know, x, y, or z. All right, so it's been a long time since we've had to derive something. So I know you're excited. Okay, so we're going to derive the same formula we were using in the last class, the work kinetic energy theorem, which of course we know has velocities in it because kinetic energy's got velocity in it, um, but for a variable force. And I understand that you're going to say, how in the world would I know to do that? Well, maybe not for this example, but towards the end of the year, we'll get better at some of these proofs sort of explanations. OK, so I'm going to start by plugging in just a formula I know for force. Because I really I want to ultimately get velocities involved in this equation. But what is our you know, main force formula? Good, F equals MA. So I'm going to plug in MA here. But of course, that only helps me get A. I really wanted Vs. But what do I know about acceleration? Especially with like some calculus stuff. Compared to velocity? Yes, I definitely want to. What, how, acceleration is what? Okay, all right, so the backwards of what you're saying. So this would be the backwards of, so acceleration is a derivative of velocity. Now, if I just stick in m and then dv over dt, and I still have dx, that's kind of a mess and that really doesn't get me anywhere. So this canon tells me you have done stuff like this when you studied parametric equations. Um, but you can, you can rewrite dv dt in terms of dx by sort of like splitting it up times, oh. and then yeah. throwing in whatever other fun variable you want to use. In our case, we're going to go with dx. But do we agree that this is a true statement? OK, because you could just cancel the dx's back out and get right back to dv dt. Derivative of velocity with respect to time. OK. Uh, and we know that dx dt is specifically something as well. Is what? V. v. Velocity. So the derivative of position with respect to time is velocity. So I'm actually now going to plug all of that mess back into my equation because now I do have velocities involved and I really got rid of the dt because I didn't have any times involved originally anyway and I have dx incorporated as well. So for fx we're plugging in m but all of this. And then I still have my original dx. And now I can start to simplify a little bit. What's going to go away? The dx. And now my integration is in terms of velocity only. And if I've changed what I'm doing the integration in terms of, I do need to change the limits as well. And the limits would need to match. So if I'm now taking the derivative in terms of velocity, I need to know, well, what would the velocity have been at position initial? Well, it, we just would have called it velocity initial and velocity final. Now, sometimes you're given like different parameters in that. Maybe at position initial velocity was 5, and then you would plug in 5 down here. Or maybe it was 0 at whatever. 
All right, and now we can integrate this. Okay, I really just want the integration of v with respect to v. m counts as a constant, so what's the integration of just the variable? What do you do? You bump the exponent up by 1 and divide by that. So the m comes out, and then I bump my exponent up by 1, so that's squared, divide by that, that's 2. And then I still have to apply my limits here from vi to vf. And so, of course, if we plug that in, so plug in vf. And in calculus, when you plug in, you, know, you always plug in the final first, and then it's minus when you plug in the initial. And this was work. So it's a very convenient formula for us. So even if my force is variable and changing, I don't necessarily care if I know the initial and final velocities. I don't even care what happened in between. I just want to know what happened initially and finally. All right, moving on. Okay, so you have a few problems like this in your homework. These should be pretty straightforward. I'm asking you for the work done by a certain variable force. Obviously, it's a changing force. And this says from position 0 to position 10. How do you do it? The area. What, how does, what does area under the curve mean if the curve is below? It's not absolute value. You can have negative area. So we have a little negative chunk of work here. And we'd have all this work here, which are what values? And I would break that into two little triangles. Well, I guess I don't need to make it a right triangle. Half the base times the height. Let's see, what is the height? Height is 6. Base is 8. 6 times 8 times half is 24. And down here, half base times height, half of... 2 times negative 3. Did I do that right? Yeah. yeah. I'm pretty good at messing up math on the board. So our answer is? Just this little, this little chunk. 21 what? Jules. There you go. Ta-da. All right, so that leads us to our most fun variable force, the spring. Spring is an easy way to analyze a variable force for us. Okay, so we're talking about variable forces, so here is a perfect example of something that provides a variable force, a spring. And Hooke's law tells us that to find the force due to a spring at any given spot, you're going to have this K value, which is a constant for that spring. K is sort of a measure of the stiffness of the spring, like how stretchy it is or not. If it's pretty, if it's like really stretchy, then it'd be a small K. If it's really stiff, that'd be a large K. Um, so, and that would be in newtons per meter as your constant. And then you're simply going to multiply it by where the spring is stretched to. What position is the object at that's attached to our spring? Okay, so here is a lovely spring example, nice horizontal spring for us. And whenever you're plugging in the position of a spring, it's relative to the resting spot. So the resting spot, of course, would be you know, where the spring isn't stretched or compressed, just right here. Um, so uh, what are the signs? Because if we go back here, we do have this negative sign involved, which means that the position and the force always have the opposite sign, which should make sense if we look at this example. Like, what would the, the sign be of this first one, of the position? Yeah, it's a positive position away from the resting spot, which apparently I need to write in. But what would you tell me about the direction of the force at that spot? So we have a positive position away from the resting spot, but the force at this particular moment is pulling it back. So we would say it's got a negative sign there. 
Hence why we need that negative sign R equation to make a match. Um, right here, of course, position is zero, force is zero. It wouldn't be pushing or pulling just for an instant. Throughout one little instant, there is no force provided. But perhaps it is, you know, about to be compressed down here, in which case our position is what value, positive or negative? Negative, and the force acting on this from the spring would be positive to the right. Another derivation. Yay. This one's actually a lot quicker. OK, so I want to der derive the work equation for a spring. Of course, spring is a variable force, so I would need to do integration. But what was the force equation we just wrote down? What is Hooke's law? Negative kx. Good. Negative k times x where x is that position away from the resting spot. Well, this time, my force is in terms of x, and I want to integrate in terms of x. So this works out great. So I have nothing really to substitute in. Well, so we can just do this. What is the integration of x in terms of x? k is a constant. Yeah, sort of like we just did uh, with the kinetic energy. We'd have x squared over 2. And we'll plug in. Minus, minus half kxi squared. So that's not really the prettiest way of writing that. So it's the opposite of the other one. So it's, it is the opposite of the other one. And that I find people forget a lot with memorizing these equations. You know, you have the work formula that's change in kinetic energy, where that really is final minus initial. But this one we actually like to rearrange just to make get rid of the our extra little negative negative and put the initial first, 1 half kxi squared. That comes first, minus OK? Now, as far as talking about the work done by a spring, does it really matter if it's if the displacement's positive or negative, like if it's pushed out maybe two centimeters or, or pulled out two centimeters or pushed in two centimeters, does that matter? No, because just like the kinetic energy is squared, so any negative sign there would be squared anyway. How would we make the work done by a spring uh, a positive value? What would have to be true? Yes. If the work done by a spring is positive, the initial you know, position away from the resting spot, the initial distance, has to be greater than the final. So that leads into checkpoint number four, page 142. Um, it says, for three situations, the initial and final positions, respectively, along an x-axis uh, for the block in figure 711. But that was just a, a block on a spring, like we were just talking about are the following. So in which done by the spring positive. Where we just learned if you want the most positive work, you would want the biggest xi value and the smallest xf value, regardless of whether they're positive or negative. So that would be which case? Um, the first one, it would be negative. And the second one, it would also be negative. And then the last one, it would be zero. Okay, the last one's definitely zero. The second one definitely is negative. But the second one and the first one are opposites. In the first one, three was the initial. You want the initial to be greater. 
the greatest magnitude, regardless of positive or negative sign, because you're going to square it anyway. Yeah, so A is positive. B is negative, like you said, and C is zero. Okay, so work problem involving a spring. And if we have that equation where we know the initial and final uh, positions, you know, that formula makes it pretty easy on us. No calculus needed. So we have a block of mass, 1.6 kilograms, is attached to a horizontal spring, uh, which has a force constant of 1,000 newtons per meter. The force constant, that's the what in our equation? What, yeah, what letter? That's the K. That's our K value. The spring is compressed two centimeters and then released from rest. Calculate the speed of the block as it passes through the equilibrium position, x equals zero, if the surface is frictionless. Okay, it actually does not say anything about work anyway. But we do see it's a spring, and we do see the question is calculate the speed. So how do we relate speed? The, I mean, the formula we just solved for work didn't have speed in it, but but the formula we just solved for was a work formula. So if it's a work formula, what other work formula has speed in it? The one what? The one, the one with speed in it. The one with velocity, our change in kinetic energy. So 1 half mvf squared minus 1 half m. The I squared. So I can set all that equal. And hopefully a few of these terms are going to be zero. Yes. We're calculating the final speed. That's the actual thing we're trying to figure out. But what can go away? Good. Release from rest. So I don't even need this term. That's zero. And the initial position? No. There is a position that's zero, but is it the initial? It's the final. It says it is compressed two centimeters and then released, um, and then it goes through the equilibrium of x zero. So the x equals zero is the final one. So that part goes to zero. So that makes this a little simpler. And I would really end up with half on each side, so do I even need that? No. So that boils down a lot. And I don't even need the halves. No, because they're on the same, or they're on opposite sides. So now it's just kind of plug in. So I got my 1.6 VF squared equals K is 1,000 newtons per meter. And what do I plug in for xi? Well, I guess it doesn't you, yeah, technically, based on our picture, it would be negative 2. But like you said, it doesn't matter. But it would be negative 2 centimeters. Uh, yes. So we've got to move our decimal twice. And you're right. I guess it should be negative. But do watch out for that. You'll often have spring distances in centimeters, so you're going to need to change that to match all our other SI units. So that, that was good mental math. Divide by 1.6. I can't do that one. And, that's and then square root. And that is 0.5. Oh, I guess, yeah, because that's a, a quarter of 1 point, or 4 would be a quarter of 16. Oh, amazing. We did this all in our head. And by we, I mean you guys. Or maybe you use a calculator. But it does make sense when you think about it afterwards. So this would be 0.5. Because when you are squaring a fraction, it gets smaller. But this would be meters per second, not centimeters per second, because we switched to SI units. So last little subtopic in chapter 7 is power. 
Uh, perhaps you remember studying power in ninth grade. Do you remember the power activity we did in ninth grade? The power lab was where we ran up the stairs. And you could figure out your work to go up the stairs, because we just assumed that that was opposite of the work done by gravity. But you needed to time yourself, because it was the rate at which work is done. So if you take work and divide it by time, that is essentially power. Um, and perhaps you did it in physics if you took physics last year. Uh, there is a relationship with horsepower. That is apparently an actual unit of measurement. Um, one horsepower is so that's what we did in ninth grade. Like you calculated what percent of horse you were, like your point a horse. Okay, I see that had a lasting impression. But unit is watts. So another W thrown in there. Just be a little careful with all the Ws. Average power be work divided by time. Um, but instantaneous power, of course, is really technically the derivative of work with respect to time. And then, of course, you could plug in whatever certain time you want. Yes. I don't know. I don't know what particular horse that's based off of. Uh, so deriving one more um, equation for power real quick, since it's the derivative of work, and we know a nice other formula for work, uh, we can say it's the derivative with respect to time of you know, force dot distance. I really am going to leave that as x for the moment. But what is uh, this part of it? Velocity. Velocity. So another power formula is force times velocity. And actually, it is, a, it is a dot product. Like, they would have to be in line again. And this is instantaneous power at you know, one particular velocity, the force that matches, the net force that you would have at whatever certain velocity your object is moving at. Can an applied force have components? Oh, absolutely. Sure. You don't necessarily have to find them, though. But like, you know, we were pushing the box up the ramp. Yeah. Sure, it absolutely has components. You know, you could say it has x and y. You could, even, you could, I mean, you can describe components however you want. You can say it has, well, I guess parallel would just be that, but. You can align your x-axis however you want. We just try to choose things that are convenient to us. But the reason why we didn't find components like the very first problem being in class was because I didn't need the components since I knew a direction that matched. If you know the distance and it matches that same direction of, as the force, that essentially is the dot product. Just multiply those two things together. But if the game is like the bottom yeah, now, if you're pushing down on this box and it's sliding across the floor to the right, you cannot just multiply that times that. That would be a case where you'd certainly want to find the component that matches that direction. If you knew the angle, now be a little careful about the angle because, okay, so here's you know tail and head of the vector, tail and head of the vector. Technically, the angle part of that is between them. Like, if they, if they are tail to tail, what is that angle? So, like in this picture, I would have to know specifically that angle. And then, yeah, you could just do F times D times cosine of the angle. But if they were, if the problem was trying to make your life difficult, you know, maybe they'd give you this angle. And in which case, you would get the wrong answer. Because just doing cosine of this angle doesn't give you the x component. It would give you the y component. Yeah, you could easily find it. But just in that formula, 
where it's like a dot b equals a times b times cosine of the angle. The angle is the angle between the two tails of the vector. Okay, and Tyler, you got this next checkpoint. Page 144, quick power question. Okay, it says... Is the power of the force exerted on the block by the cord positive, negative, or zero? And how would you even know? It does not necessarily say at this certain instant where the force from the tension is this and the speed of the you know, object is this. It just says it moves in uniform circular motion like what is the overall power? Well, we would need to know the overall work or the overall force, but of course the force is an ever-changing thing. So what, what, what would be the net work done well, by that cord? Zero. Perhaps the better way to preface that would be the work equals change in kinetic energy theorem. And what is the change in kinetic energy? Zero. I mean, it has kinetic energy, but as far as it changing, it's not. It's got the same constant speed the whole time. It says uniform circular motion. So there is no net work done. Um, so there's no power technically either. This is work over time. OK, quick power problem. What must be the minimum power here? It says an elevator car has a mass of 1,000 kilograms and is carrying passengers having a combined mass of 800 kilograms. A constant frictional force of 4,000 newtons retards its motion upward. What must be the minimum power delivered by the motor to lift the elevator at a constant speed of 3 meters per second? All right, well, it says power, and it just gave me a speed. So I'm really thinking of that formula that we just came up with. And technically, that is a dot product, too. They should be in the same direction. Um, so I need a force. I've, I got the speed. The speed's three. But what is the force? And what forces do I? I mean, is there one force? It's an elevator. What's that on an elevator? All right. Wait. So let's calculate that first. Well, actually, I think more. Yeah, our weight's going to be 1,800 times 9.81. What is it? Okay, so that is the weight. Other forces? Yeah, there's got to be something pulling it up, some kind of tension in the cord. which would be what we want to know. <laughs> is there normal force? No. Is it sitting on the ground, like on a surface? No. I mean, there's a normal force on like a person inside it, but it's talking about the elevator, the whole thing. So then would the tension be equal to the weight minus the Well, friction, yeah, friction is going to be down, and it says it's 4,000 newtons. So we are assuming, yeah, we're assuming these are all equal. It says what minimum power. So to at least be moving, we need to equal the forces downward. So the tension upward would be 4,000 plus 17,600. And that's the force that I want to use because that's the, you know the tension in the cord. You know, it's coming by. Thank you. I'm glad you guys are on top of it. So multiply that by three. And what unit? Watts. 
if you want to divide by 746, you could figure out how many horses that would be. <laughs> All right. That is the end of our work chapter.